uh, our last panel. Uh, the title is the European Community from the Outside, Perspectives from Latin America, Japan, and Turkey. Our discussion this morning is Professor Francesca Fauri from the University of Bologna. And our panelists are Cristina Lancosio Lopez, Itoshi Suzuki, and Mio Chalder. Thank you. 
informs about it. So it was sometimes a pragmatic and uh, rather, rather a selfish actor in this relationship. But at the end, I will explain why I thought I think it could be defined as a win-win situation in, in the consolidation of, of, this, of this relationship between Latin America and Europe. I will explain that. Uh, I, will, I will go deeper into the question of the contextual um, priorities of the relationship between Latin America and the European Union because it was, it's something that has been really very thoroughly analyzed um, from the point of view of this regulation uh, in the, the links between the United States, Europe and Latin America. So I will focus rather on conceptual priorities and on the, um, the idea of how points of convergence to have the consolidation of this dual relationship. First of all, I would like to start by a period in the end of the 1950s that I call the unfitting mirror asymmetries of our ever postponed conceptual convergence after World War II. And this is also very, very linked to a very important question already posed by one of the, the classical uh, authors in the literature about the, this issue, who is Altenberg, who asks the question, uh, is the relationship between Spain and Latin America another example of a fraternity without substance, meaning that they always, especially from the Spanish side, Spain always emphasizes uh, this um, close ties with Latin America due to language, culture, also the migration in both directions. But is there something more, is there a real implementation that goes beyond this discourse of fraternity? So my question is, which is the, the substance of, of this uh, fraternity uh, discourse? And uh, first of all, we see that since the foundation of the Organization of American States, more than being a, a European interest in, in this uh, kind of regional integration process in Latin America, there was more of a lateral one, for example, at the end of the 1950s, and also coinciding with uh, the development of, of European integration, the treaties of Rome, etc. There was an interest from the part of the always Spain, but Italy and France, that created a sense of jealousy in Spain because Spain normally thought the monopoly of this kind of special relationship with Latin America and its with Europe. During Franco's regime, the sense of exclusivity of, of this relationship was always emphasized. And I should explain also that the two main lines of Spain's uh, foreign policy were traditionally towards Europe and towards Latin America. So during Franco's regime, when they were planning were planning how to develop these foreign relations, they, also, they always said that Europe was a real priority. And using many making history claims in this sense, they refer to the idea that they discovered America because they were in Europe, they were part of Europe. And that Europe was a priority, and Latin America was seen as the, an alternative solution if uh, the, the development of those relations Close 
sort of 
fashion, but civil society has a different approach. So, uh, in this context, in this period after accession, Spain wants to have um, uh, a very, to be regarded as a real power within the foreign policy of the, of the European community, and they think that they can take advantage of this so-called special relation with Latin America, so they propose themselves as the facilitators and as the mediators to uh, further approach you know, of these two, two world entities. This means that a lot of a very important budget is allocated for Spanish authorities, for the development of this activity, so they can apply all the necessary means to implement this cooperation for development. There's something very important in, in this period that I wanted to, to point out, and it's the fact that globally the European authorities, the European representatives, are insisting that they only want to relate to the, the political representatives in, in Latin America, if possible, through these regional integration entities, Mercosur, Comunidad Latina, and so on. And this is very paradoxical because they are demanding a kind of single voice within this very heterogeneous Latin America that the European community lacks. And even nowadays, we will see what happens with the Lisbon Treaty and the establishment of a higher representative for foreign policy. But they are demanding a single voice that they don't really have. There are many contradictions in this. And they are not that much offering the means and the knowledge uh, to develop these this regional uh, entities no? in this period. So, um, afterwards, in the 1990s, we started a new period that I have defined as open regionalism. For regional integration, we want something called, especially by the European Commission authorities, open regionalism, and I explain as the convergence of conceptual priorities, and also we discuss as the challenges ahead. One of the main actors in this process was precisely one of my interviews, Manuel Marín González, who was a commissioner for cooperation for development. And he explained that in the early 90s, um, Asia and Latin America belonged to the same foreign policy line. So it was Spain, the Spanish authorities, through the filter of this commissioner, who were insisting in creating a priority line and differentiating personality. In this period, open regionalism was developed, for example, by a treaty of free trade and special agreement with Chile and agreement with Mercosur and so on. So, open regionalism was a key. And there was also a very active and dynamic relationship with the organization of the American states, especially to deal with the post war periods in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And one of the most uh, curious Observations of this period of the 1990s is the assimilation of Spanish and European interests and positions in the discourse about the relation with Latin America. Before, I think especially between the accession and this period of the 1990s, the pragmatism of Spain was clear of the national interest, what they could get uh, from Latin America in terms of influence, commercial uh, relations, economic uh, and foreign direct investment. So, uh, by being with the European community, it was more clear, but now it seems to be blurred. European interest and Spanish interest is the same, is presented at the same, and this is very coherent because otherwise it wouldn't have a weight. They have to present it as, as, a, as a synonym because otherwise it wouldn't have a weight in this foreign policy line. Um, then there are, there are many interesting initiatives that again were uh, referred to. Was president of the European Parliament, he created something called Parlatino, um, and this means that the European Parliament started to establish direct relations with several parliaments, national and regional parliaments in Latin America, to create an articulated relation based in this parliament, uh, a parliamentary approach and a political representative approach. And then they started to do the same with NGOs, trying to society in the European Union countries and then in, in, in Latin America. So that was one of the most uh, dynamic periods, I would say. And 
then um, also bilateral relations through something called, not always in a positive way, summit diplomacy, which was more bilateral, that you know, regional, as they really wanted, started to take place. And uh, I also think that this closer approach to Latin America brought about a lot of interesting knowledge, uh, like for example, the how to study political transitions. Many times I have some comparisons between political transitions in Eastern Europe, in Latin America. So how transitions were dealt with and implemented was something an important one that we were getting from these cases. And uh, there was of course a demand expansion of economic interest in Latin America. And uh, also the, there was a, a funding but one of the most interesting aspects of this uh, consolidation of this relation is uh, the study of how Latin America has been Europe Europeanized, as also the member states were Europeanized in this process, but also the, the opposite one. How the European Union is gaining a special knowledge and understanding of regional relations through the case of Latin America, the stabilization of democracy, and I explained before, and relations with the United States, because relations with Latin America, of course, they are you know, a special filter to arrive at the study of how to improve relations with the United States. So, uh, as I said, I think it was a win-win situation. Spain got a lot of uh, resources and support for developing this cooperation, development aid, and growth for development program without making a special budget effort. And, but Latin America got many, many benefits as well. I'll give you many examples. First of all, the credit line that is now being uh, developed with the EU, um, European Investment Bank. The Dominican Republic is now part of the ECB countries uh, rule. The inclusion of Latin America in the EU social cohesion ones, for example, one called Educación para Todos, also the, the fact of being part of many of the important European environmental programs, programs to improve equal opportunities between men and women in different realms, and also support indigenous population. So my conclusion is that when I would have started as a, as a rather pragmatic approach from, from the side of Spain, turned out to be a benefit also for Latin America. So we could say was a pragmatism that resulted in a mutual uh, benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the paper. Now I introduce uh, Itoshi Suzuki and uh, his paper about uh, the common foreign trade policy and the European communities in the between the 50s and the 90s. Stop, stop quarreling over trade. So, uh, when I apply 
time for the small press, I was I had a rather big mouth saying that I'm going to speak until the 1990s, but uh, archival evidence is only available until the 70s, uh, including Japanese foreign industry. So uh, I have shrinked down a bit, and uh, that's what I'm talking about, ups and downs, and a bit more realistic than that. My story ends at 1978. But the reason why I end at 1978 is that uh, the agreement which was reached between the European Commission and the Japanese Foreign Ministry in 1978, in March, uh, exactly draws the basic line, the very basic lines of how the trade conflict could be solved between the two parties. So uh, that was why I entitled my paper, uh, corrected it, uh, that the time period is 1957 to 1978. Uh, before going into the uh, contents, I'd like to talk about uh, what happened over lunch yesterday. That was why, because I was thinking, I was sometimes all over that scene, that uh, we sometimes do misunderstand it, I'm afraid. And uh, Axel and I, Axel from Norway and uh, I from Japan, were sitting together. And uh, eventually it became a debate about catching whales is good or not. And uh, uh, I was suddenly uh, rememberized that I'm in Europe. <laughs> we were criticized all over that uh, how savage people we are. I said I'm sorry we're wrong, but uh, Axel didn't say so, so uh, <laughs> well, probably that was the wrong interpretation of what happened, but uh, you see there are misunderstandings, and uh, both sides tend to insist that we're saying right by we're the unfair ones to come up with unfair claims. That, but then that still could be solved, and that's the story I'd like to uh, interpret here. It's because Japan's image during the 60s and 70s and 80s, Japan's image of Europe, uh, both member states and the EC, uh, was that it's not Japan who's unfair, but it's the Europeans who are unfair, uh, having protectionist barriers, which, in, which means that tariff or non tariff barriers, and that uh, due to the statistics or whatever, a detailed analysis of how Japanese cars are well made, etc., etc., I'm not going into that. But, uh, so Japan's claim was only based that we are right and you are wrong. And so Japan had a very wrong image, I would say. But then, was that true for the Europeans? I don't think that the Europeans were also not really right in what claiming towards Japan. And that uh, uh, Japan was seen as an unwelcome newcomer, so to say, in the international relations, because uh, Japan joined the uh, UN uh, 
long history. And uh, Japanese export damaging the uh, business interests of these industries was a very serious problem. But during the 60s, even if the common foreign policy was not there yet, the commission or any sub-commission, working groups, ad hoc committees under the commission was used by the member states in order to negotiate who wants to use the bilateral safeguard against Japanese textile exports. So there was not a common foreign policy yet, but it was already the commission and its suborgans, whatever they are talking about, was used in order to coordinate the trade relations with Japan. That's the point of the 60s. And uh, the most hostile countries against Japan were the Venezuelan countries. Uh, their industry is small, and that, uh, that means that uh, if Japanese export comes, uh, so many unemployed workers will come. Italy and France were rather worried about Japanese export, but was still careful enough not to suddenly use safeguards. And of course, that means that you, you want to also export to America or wherever else. So if you easily use the safeguard against Japan, you might even have to face the same claim back somewhere else. So Italy and France was still careful. Uh, Germany seems to be the most uh, free trade uh, pressure among the European countries, but I'll come back to that later in the 70s because Germany cited Japan more than cited Italy and France in some cases, but still there were cases that Germany would speak against Japan, and I'll just come back to that in the final part of my speech. And the Commission, of course, becomes closest to the German position, saying that, okay, we have to do free trade because inside the EEC, which became EEC uh, shortly after, uh, we're doing free trade, so we could not say we don't want free trade when we won't have to do the external relations. So this was very complex, a difficult complex for uh, all Europeans, uh, be it the uh, European Commission or the nation state governments uh, to solve. So this was the um, situation of the uh, 60s. And I would like to add that the Commission already done some serious uh, research projects of Japan as a threat. And uh, this was done not only in terms of foreign relations, but in terms of social problems. That the uh, advantage Japanese industry seems to have is due to the low wages and some bad working standards, which I am very critical. That's why I'm in this room here. But uh, the Commission was already seeing Japan as a threat, or starting to see Japan as a threat, and the social issues being the core of Japanese advantage, and that's exactly the problem for Europeans, because you don't want to, you know, make compromises on such an important way of life sort of uh, question. So that was the 60s. Now, uh, I'd like to go into the second part, the 70s, when the uh, common foreign policy started. Uh, it started January 1970 by the right in the Japanese case. Uh, now, due to the uh, unanimity of the uh, Council of Foreign Ministers, now the Commission was the sole negotiator with the Japanese, the Japanese foreign ministry to negotiate the trade. At first, it was, I mean, countries, I guess, except for Germany, were trying to make the uh, bilateral safeguard into a community safeguard, so that whenever the community agrees that Japanese cars or textile or whatever product is a sensible issue, that's seriously damaging Europe. That means that export could be stopped legally and This was the first idea, but uh, well, uh, in Japanese, thanks to the Germans, uh, the Germans said, they said no to this at the uh, council. So this never became a unanimity. But probably this was not good for the Japanese ministry, not only the foreign ministry, but especially the MITI, the, the Ministry of Economy, uh, shortly say, and Japanese business, because uh, the Japanese took it too much optimistic. Okay, the Germans, as long as the Germans say no, we could export. But that was very wrong. And Germany turned after the war crisis, at uh, first war crisis, and Germany suddenly starts to become a bit cautious and at least not side Japan, which became a dangerous signal. But still, Japanese uh, government, both foreign ministry and the economy uh, and business, uh, did not see this enough. So there was unawareness of the Japanese side. So that's why I'm saying that Japan was also wrong. That day not grasping what's going on, the complex inside of Europe, which is very important, uh, as all of us think, because they should have, but uh, Japan is still not aware of it. And later on, Japan comes to complain about that, that, that they're using the complex 
university in order to delay the negotiations. So this was stopped by the Americans, the Japanese also planned to escape. So uh, this was how the uh, common foreign policy started. And just like I said, the first oil crisis, which broke up at the uh, end of 1973, um, this very much changed the situation. Up then, the Commission was solely in charge of negotiating with the Japanese foreign ministry, but the Commission very importantly never stopped the member state governments doing bilateral negotiations with the Japanese ministry uh, in charge. So this was, um, I think, very important. I think the Commission did have right, legal right, to block such things, but the Commission saw that it's also important that the member state governments, each of them, would also try to reach the Japanese side, be it the foreign ministry, the economy, or the business groups. Uh, uh, so it was parallel going on. It's European Commission and the Japanese also at multi-levels like that, between a French business group and Japanese business group, uh, a German foreign ministry and ministry of economy with Japanese ministries at the same time. Now, but this suddenly turned into a serious crisis because it was not only oil strong, uh, something uh, very unfortunate for the Europeans, I would say, happened. And two things. One thing is that the economy turned very bad, especially in 1975, 1976. So any public opinion, uh, not only in Italy but also in Germany, starts seeing Japan that its export is causing unemployment, mass unemployment in their countries, in their labor markets. So the criticism against Japan heated up very much. And the second thing, and this was even worse, I think, uh, Japan suddenly came up with a trade agreement only with the United States. Uh, what does that mean? Probably this is important, it's why the G6 summit, the G8 summit became uh, important, and why we have so many diplomatic, multilateral sort of diplomatic uh, conferences. Uh, what this meant was that uh, the Americans and Japanese, at least from European eyes, uh, it seems that the Americans and Japanese are cheating the Europeans. That if Japan first agrees with the United States while having no agreement with the Europeans, that means that Japanese export, which couldn't go to America, would seriously flood towards Europe just because there's too much to sell while the Japanese market is so small that, uh, but still, we wanted to recover from the crisis. So what you could do is export. Well, that's common for Italy, that's common for France, common for any European country, because, because we're always scarce of energy resources and uh, raw materials. Uh, so when, uh, that's what exactly happened. So, in European eyes at least, it appears that Japan cheated Europe, or was it America? That Japan and America first had agreements and started to flood Japanese export towards Europe. Now, I don't see any agreement of doing that, but at least as a consequence, that was what happened. So, this was why the trade conflict between the EC, the European Commission, and the Japanese foreign ministry became a serious problem. Now, I'm not going into the uh, details of how serious that is, so I'll all uh, review in my paper. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'll just quickly look into the, which is the third part of my uh, story and just try to conclude. Now, just as I said, that the European Commission was a lot more careful in negotiating with Japan, that we could not, they could not suddenly use the safeguard. But how do you solve the trade imbalance of Japan exporting but not importing, which means very bad business? had a very active proposal that Japan should be for its domestic market. Its high barriers should be abolished, the economic, economic industry and the Japanese business lobby should take more advantage that uh, the market is open for European exports in Japan. And that's just how the trade imbalance would be balanced. Now, uh, during the François Xavier Loitori's uh, presidency of the Commission, at least the Commission was careful enough, but this seemed to change when Roy Jenkins became president in 1977, uh, January. And, uh, well, I said that Germany was a friend, but in this case, under this Roy Jenkins, uh, it was precisely the Germans who started to confront the uh, Japanese. And that is the uh, vice president, uh, Wilhelm Hoffmann, who was a German trade unionist and academic. Uh, which means that whether intentional or not, that he was the very person to come to Japan and say that this is a social problem. 
that don't only see this as a trade, a, a statistics of trade, that this is already a social and political problem in Europe, so be careful. And this worked. I mean, you know, the Americans didn't send people like this, but it was the Commission who not only sent the bureaucrats, but a trade union academic who's professional on this. And this worked because some business psychology, I would say, starts to change. I'm not a professional to discourse analysis, as or Christina is saying, but, but still, uh, the Kedan and Japanese business lobby and the Miki, Japanese economic ministry, uh, starts open debate that Japan should not only export. If it wants to sell, it should build factories in Europe instead of building in Japan and exporting, which almost looks like exporting Japanese unemployment to Europe. So, uh, perhaps Japan should stop its too much severe competition in the Japanese market for the low social standards of the workers, but try to build factories in Europe so that they could solve or partly solve or try to plan to solve social problems in Europe so that Japan could, at least Japanese firms, could keep on doing business. And there was a, this was a sort of change specifically occurred during this period. And what I would like to add is that uh, who, who sort of organized this uh, formal negotiation between the Commission and the uh, I mean, uh, Minister of Kushiba uh, was in charge of the, uh, especially in charge of this case, uh, was uh, who said that this uh, thing was the uh, chairman of the EC Foreign Ministry, the Council of Foreign Ministers. And it was the Danish Foreign Minister uh, Anderson, if I remember right. So it's not the uh, with the bilateral or the Commission and Japan negotiation that the the uh, chairman the chair, chair chairmanship of the Council is supporting the Commission's negotiations. Probably that's not quite new for uh, people who do history, but uh, not only for Japanese. That uh, you see, it's not member states versus the Commission. If the member states do agree, or if it's the personal leadership of that chairman. Person. Um, it's not that, you know, versus thing, but uh, Europeans are good at using different institutions at hoc ways. So the uh, chairman of the commission, the council is helping the commission to come up with an agreement. And it was Anderson who uh, strongly persuaded Japanese foreign ministry, Minister Kushida, uh, that the Europeans want a joint communique about this issue. And that was what came in March uh, 1978 just as Europeans asked. So it's not only the Commission, uh, it was supported considerably by other institutions and other personnel of these European institutions. And uh, well, I'd like to end that, uh, as I just said, this is a very basic, basic line which showing how this trade conflict could be solved. The Toyota Yaris uh, running in the streets is uh, not an export from Japan, it's built somewhere in the French or Belgium factory or the Honda motorcycle coming from the uh, Honda factory in southern Italy or was it in Spain? Uh, these things. So, uh, uh, well, it's a good thing that it was solved and uh, less misunderstanding. So, uh, we could sort of more happily and positively interpret this history. And just as we debated yesterday, that, uh, well, probably it's an exaggeration, but this might be seen as uh, one of the roots of EU claims. At least that was how Japan saw it. That Japan and America had a trade agreements and was seriously condemned by the Commission. Why don't we have this between us? So Prime Minister Shiba suddenly started saying that look, this is a global nature problem and this should be globally applied. So of course we want to apply this with the EC. Uh, although he was very reluctant to do so, that was the terminology.
after a agreement, which was signed in 1963 and then before 1964. It was the Turkish application in 1959 to the BEC, and the negotiations following this application actually led to the conclusion of that agreement, the Ankara Agreement. Uh, and Turkey based this application on Article 228 of the Rome Treaty, which regulates, regulates association relations of the EC with non members. Um, both political security and economic factors actually played an important role in Turkey's application to the EC for establishing an association. Firstly, Turkey considers uh, EC membership as a logical of its traditional association and modernization policies, and an association agreement providing an important degree of institutional, economic, and political integration was regarded by Turkey as a crucial stepping stone to becoming a unique part of Europe. Secondly, the Greek application, actually, which was made just 16 days before the Turkish application, speeded up the Turkish decision on the kind of relationship to establish with the EEC. And Turkey's Greek response to the Greek, uh, Turkey's quick response to the Greek application should be evaluated in the context of its political and economic competition in the international arena. Uh, security concerns also arise from the community threats and the Soviet claims regarding Turkish threats and the not part of the, of the Turkish territory and also economic considerations including the benefits of the preferential market access and the need of economic aid but also other important factors play an important, uh, other, uh, factors play an important role in taking such a decision uh, for applying to this for efficient language. When it comes to the EC side, uh, security and political considerations were often considered to be more important than the economic ones, in except in, in, except in Turkish application and in concluding, concluding the association agreement. Um, deep integration in Turkey was regarded as a necessary as necessary for European security and for strategic objectives of strengthening nation NATO's southeastern flank by ensuring the economic and social and therefore political stability of Turkey. Additionally, the EEC considered the establishment of association relations with Turkey and Greece also as a good way of expanding its influence. In spite of some setbacks experienced during the negotiations like military in 1960 and this agreement parties on formal elections, the association agreement depending on the establishment of the customs union was signed and a full membership prospect as the outcome objective was included in the agreement through Article 28, of course in parallel to the Atomic Agreement, made with Greece. Um, actually, there had been no later agreement provisions similar to Article 28, having, which, have, which has a clear membership perspective or prospect. Article 28 of the Ankara Agreement commits the contracting parties to examine the possibility of Turkey's accession to the community. However, full membership is not automatic. Progression or transition from the status of being an associated to the membership status arises uh, the kindness from a political decision. In other words, Article 28 offers no guarantee but a, but a mere, but, but, but mere a prospect of admission uh, of Turkey to the uh, EEC, even if the complete conditions of association were achieved. But I have to say that it was a precise intention of the contracting parties to use the association agreement as a stepping stone to the accession. The Ankara agreement appeared to serve as a form of pre-accession agreement to prepare Turkey for full membership. The model that this association depends on is the Treaty of Treaty of Rome. And the association agreement, the Ankara agreement, includes all uh, four freedoms and common policies of this means that while the association has been on a customs union between Turkey and the EC, it also envisages closer and deeper 
our rules and according to the ultimate objective of membership. The Younger Agreement envisaged a progressive and gradual integration process through the establishment of a customs union between the parties, and this process was designed to be completed in three stages preparatory stage, transitional stage, and the final stage. Uh, now we are in the final stage. The, in the preparatory stage, Turkey didn't undertake any commitments concerning the improvement of its relations with the ECR. Just the ECR undertook commitments, like uh, financial aid and like some preferential treatment for the Turkish agricultural exports, to prepare the Turkish economy for performing its obligations during the succeeding stages, and especially in uh, the transitional stages. Uh, the transitional stage started in 1973 with the entry into force of an additional protocol to the Ankara Agreement, which was agreed by the parties in order to provide for conditions, meeting the rules, and timetables relating to the implementation of the customs uh, union, or in the related to the establishment of the customs union and also the implementation of the transitional stage. The aim of the transition stage is to establish progressively the customs union in the Turkey community within 12 to 22 years and also to align the current policies of Turkey with those of the community. The customs union will be established uh, on the basis of mutual and balanced knowledge but in an asymmetric manner. Contrary to the preparatory stage, in the during the during the transitional stage, serious problems, particularly relating to the common issues for the centuries, and also political issues for the parties were experienced in the elections. That's why the implementation of the Anti-Agreement and the Edition Protocol never did the launch until the early 1990s. Turkey experienced important problems heavily due to uh, heavily due to in capacity in complying with its contractual uh, commitments arising from the edition protocol. In Turkey, I mean, at the time, the uh, equal substitution policy was dominant as, a, as, 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 as the development policy in Turkey. And that policy uh, during the 1970s was responsible, was actually uh, regarded as for the for the for this incapacity, for the incapacity of Turkey for complying with its contractual obligations because of its uh, quite protectionist nature. You know, uh, because of its I mean, this protectionist nature actually was totally contradictory to the liberal economic policy in the context of premium of goods, in the context of the uh, establishing the customs union between the parties. Another problem for Turkey in its relations with the EC, which had negatively influenced its performance for the implementation of the transition, transition stage, was related to the developments in the EC's external and internal policies. Turkey had serious concerns about, for example, the global Mediterranean policy of the EC, and also the generalized, uh, generalized system of preferences, and also the EC's first alignment and its forthcoming Mediterranean and enlargement towards Greece, Spain, and Portugal. Turkey regarded all these developments, would uh, regard all these developments, uh, would regard that way, all these developments would undermine its trade preferences arising resulting from its um, associated membership status. All these concerns, of course, as you can guess, echo weight of the reluctance in Turkey towards the customs union, being resulted from the existing capacity of the Turkish economy, and led to a quite weak performance concerning fulfilling its commitments during the transition stage. However, it's not only uh, it's not only Turkey actually which uh, should uh, be regarded as responsible for the long functioning of the Anglican Temple Initiative. 
some rules like textiles that will be realized within 12 years, and also green model workers that will be realized between 1976 and 1986, and implementation of the financial assistance of 600 million and 204 financial protocol. More importantly, the EC couldn't revise or the EC didn't have willingness to realize the instruments of the association agreement in order to offset the negative impacts of changes of the association occurred in its external and internal uh, policies. 1980 military coup aggravated of course the existing problems in Turkey and the EC in relation to the implementation of the transition stage. After a long period of suspension of relations with the country's return to democracy, both parties put forward their common interest in working for a selective relationship. But actually, their ways in reaching that and their objectives, of course, uh, differentiated. Indeed, Turkey applied to the EC for full membership in 1987, and it told that uh, the association power uh, started with this association uh, application to the EC in 1959, uh, which mainly depends on the customs union. It has not been able to operate as it was intended, as it was designed. The ultimate objective of the association was to manage, but Turkey was a far from by mid 1980s, uh, the assumption of the customs union, which was the means for the membership, seemed to, seemed to have become a failure. Turkish authorities came to the conclusion that the association constituted an inappropriate framework or another framework for reaching uh, the full membership objective. However, one may assert that the timing was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> 
decision making she hasn't been able to pro proceed as it has been intended. It had got it had got far behind the declared objectives. The transition stage had failed to resolve in progressive integration as envisaged in the Ankara Agreement and the Edition Protocol. And all the reasons behind this failure, the non fulfillment of the uh, obligations by the parties comes first. The incapacity of Turkey and the reluctance of the EC to perform commitments regarding the customs union might be regarded as the leading factors responsible for the malfunctioning of the association relationship or the association agreement. And also, the disparity between the parties regarding the understanding about and interpretation of the objectives of the association constituted another important while Turkey mainly focused on the long-term political objective of membership and therefore regarded the association as a rather political as a rather uh, political game, the EC was almost exclusively driven by shorter shorter uh, term economic objectives uh, of the association and ignored its declared output objective. The EC has had important reservations about Turkey's membership. Therefore, it is tended to regard the association as an instrument for strengthening relations with an important strategic partner rather than a potential member whose political stability is important for the EC's interests and can be secured by ensuring its economic development. Indeed, the EC was reluctant to diminish or to it is uh, said uh, the negative impacts of developments in the reintegration on relations with Turkey and couldn't improve the instrument of the association by taking into account the needs of Turkey. Therefore, not only the incapacity of Turkey to perform its commitments arising from the eight payments, the association agreement, but also the lack of political will on the side, which is a second requirement for achieving the objectives of the agreement, are responsible for the failure of the association in serving as a preferred stage to the membership. Thank you very much. So, um, so what 
question of Turkish water, but no, during the sixties, at the end of the sixties, then when Italy didn't need them more than the family uh, of the Koreans came down. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look at Germany and the amount of Turkish water that was we were able to, to find a job in Germany, I'm wondering how uh, you say that Germany in the end was not in this market for Turkey to, to go to, but at least in the beginning there must have been a way to move there because I think that still now nowadays they are the biggest foreign group uh, in working in Germany. So I was wondering how this uh, kind of relationship developed maybe outside the EU. I mean, it was more a private business to travel and make a relationship. And, uh, and, and would, you, would you say that this could be a third possible model of the integration process in a certain sense? A limited economic integration, more like a, a trade act kind of union, the one that is, was established between Turkey and, and, and Europe. And uh, uh, Turkey seems to be as a kind of a standby applicant. And so is there, it's always asking. So, but then there are always uh, constraints that uh, other political and economic that just impede for to, to join uh, the European Union. So, this is a more general question. Of course, what do you think? Uh, how do you think this relationship will evolve in the future? Do you think it will just remain like this forever? Yes. So this is the third way, it will just stay like this. Just a, a, a strategic alliance, let's say, a, a, a kind of economic, uh, little economic improvements, but in the end, I mean, do you think they just stay this way? Or I mean, what is your opinion, of, you know, based on the fact that they're so study so much the uh, historical evolution of the relationship of Queen Italians about the future. And this is my part, I don't know, should they answer the question or do you prefer me to ask uh, if... Yeah. Yes? Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, well, maybe.
increase um, that in the 60s starts to develop a uh, very dense relationship, uh, not so much with Europe, not only in Europe in the sense of the community, but Europe as a large entity, but more specifically with Germany. Either we consider and we bring into our analysis Germany and Germany's choices for the policy choices, economic trends more organically, or we are actually talking about a sort of empty shell. Balance of the natural remedies that we do, we probably should. Uh, we should be aware that, that we need much more on, on what was the sort of central economic dynamism, but also of linkages, agreements, contacts. Uh, uh, and, and the case of Yugoslavia that we discussed yesterday is very much the same in terms of my question. Uh, the second point is, is, is a question and a comment about the conscious. Um, because when you were telling the story, about you know, the, the, the Japanese business and political elite sort of discussing issues they might find in Europe and decide to go and invest in Europe. Inevitably, the mind goes back to a moment about 20 years earlier when uh, Americans made the same choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting both to see how the mechanisms work differently, uh, but also maybe there are a few implications uh, that I would like to bring up from your argument if that is possible the same for your business. And, and the story is this that uh, in, in 56, 57, when the Americans were considering the implications of the common market negotiations, at a certain point uh, the uh, commerce department and the treasury department opened up a large investigation are you guys concerned? You want us to go bang on the door and tell the Europeans that uh, we're not going to accept a high external tariff? And of course, a lot of the small companies say, yeah, well, yes, we're very worried that we still go bang on the door. But the big companies, IBM, automobile, chemical, said, we just don't care. All right? You guys in Washington can do what you want. We don't care because we decided to invest massively. And therefore, the common tariff uh, is not a concern of ours. And that's what they did. And that's what triggered all the European cry that eventually ended up in the fee American, right? In the now, aside from the different institutional arrangements, you now corporations making their decisions and telling Washington what you do, what you don't, that's what really matter. And of course, the, the arrangements are kind of different, and we know it's different. What, what interests me that decisions like this, in the American case in the late 50s and early 60s, was based on a forecast of very dynamic growth of the new expanded common market. Otherwise, it would make business sense to make huge investments in a market that is not dynamic. Uh, I wonder whether there is anything like this in the Japanese case, because Europe in the early 80s, early 2000s, uh, was perceived as a highly dynamic market where it was worthwhile making huge investments counting on long-term uh, sustained growth or was a market that was considered by friends that it was by the European themselves in much more shaky situations in which the people were not more sure of long-term sustained growth. So, in a way, what I'm asking is the, the business component, the economic strict economic component of this decision. Uh, where is it? Uh, do, do you have any research? Is it possible to investigate? Are the you know, largest corporations that make investments in Europe uh, records available? Or are we simply, are you simply investigating the sort of meeting level of policy coordination, policy decisions? Because uh, this makes a whole lot of difference in terms of the perception and second, I was also wondering whether this decision to invest in Europe is it coming also on the way of the first major expansion of the Japanese business in East Asia, the start of the century. So is this, in a way, replicating and extending to Europe the mechanism that the major Japanese business has started to do in, uh, in East Asia?
of uneasiness in all actually the papers dealing with enlargement, if written by historians that do not take into account culture, geopolitics, uh, politics. And it's being written from a Turkish scholar, and being Turkey, not, it's not Greece, Turkey, it's one of the greatest uh, geopolitical powers in uh, Eurasia, uh, with a huge history uh, of basically being one of the ruling uh, uh, cultures in the Mediterranean and not only that. So, what I expect from a paper written on enlargement is I want to know more about everything related to what is the international context. Uh, uh, for example, in the 60s, when the first uh, accession uh, agreement was signed. In the 1960s, Western Europe could be seen as a very dynamic and one of the few dynamic uh, economic uh, areas in the region. But if you consider the scenery in the 1990s or even more recently, uh, I mean, Iran is a hugely dynamic uh, economic area and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Turkish citizens can go in Iran without even a visa. Uh, and the same applies for, uh, for Russia. And this also explains why Turkey has not actually gone through the economic crisis nowadays. Uh, in the same way as European countries are going through it. So if you, the, my, my, my point is, if you write a history of how these legal negotiations went without explaining the revolution that happened in the world between the 1960s and the 80s when Iran became a major also industrial power and potentially uh, one of the areas that would be much more interesting for Turkey than, uh, uh, than its partners in, uh, in Western Europe. And I did go to a conference of uh, Turkish historians and the majority of them are not actually interested in entering the, the European Union nowadays. They think that, that Turkey has a much bigger role to play than being a member of the European Union in, the, in Central Asia, in special links with some Central Asian countries. So if you don't take all these things into account, I mean, you, you, you have to speak of political will, but you never explain why there is this, uh, uh, this problem of political will. So my suggestion would be you have to take into account politics, you have to take into account culture, you have to take into account geopolitics and what Turkey represents. It's not, the negotiations with Turkey are not by the marginal country or the, no offense to Greek people if there are any here, but it's a marginal country compared to what Turkey uh, represents. So if for Greece maybe I can, would be wrong, but maybe you could do something also more legalistic in approach. I mean it would be wrong anyway. With Turkey it's it, it's very limited explanations of how the environment grows. But the same goes a bit for Christina. Uh, even that, you cannot avoid speaking, uh, uh, you don't hear about politics. Uh, your paper ends in 1999. Okay, curiously enough, it's sort of the, day, the year before uh, Chavez uh, uh, goes to power, and everything changes, uh, Latin America, uh, sort of Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, Nicaragua, the, the sort of create uh, a kind of alliance which is based on sort of anti-Americanism but also anti-Europeanism for, Euro for what the European Union represents and uh, Lula in Brazil uh, uh, is possibly a product also of the links with European social democracy but is one of the main, uh, uh, he embodies the relevance of Latin America and of, uh, of an independent Latin American policy which chooses Europe as a, as a, well, it's not an enemy in the sense of going to war with it, but 
it's an anemone necronometer. So even here, I mean, I, I think it's crucial to speak about uh, what it is that you this Yeah. It's how about the No, I know, but I mean, that's the theory that we Okay. Theory that. I think um, we don't have much more time for questions, so I ask you to answer and possibly in the same order as you presented in the paper. So we start with Christine. Okay, thank you very much for your comments and questions. For support, thank you, Professor Marie, for all your very focused questions. And I would like to answer a different question and answer at the same time, and one of the questions. When you asked me about um, these regional structures, uh, regional integration, of course, this answer becomes clear and uh, really an objective in the 1990s, but it's already rooted and made developed from the 1960s. I have recently, uh, recently had a chance to interview one person who's currently working at uh, the delegation of the European Union in Washington, D.C., who, who took an active part in, in this process of uh, trying to create these regional interlocutors with, uh, in Latin America. And uh, what he explained, of course, and it's something that I think as well, it's not an Spanish influence, it's a pressure that comes from the European community, the European Union, and uh, as he explained it, it was not done just to have this equivalent in terms of uh, dialogue between the two regions, but it was a way of helping them to develop, as you said before, a, a more commercial, economically based integration that could eventually lead to a political one. So they envisage it as a way to help integration in Latin America, but at the same time, as I said, and this is my criticism, I think they didn't really offer the means to develop that or the knowledge sources to implement it. So I think there is something lacking in this sense. And linking it to your question, uh, yeah, there was no foreign policy, of course. I was studying more abstract terms. But uh, when you talk about this uh, idea of, of the, the single voice, and reading documents that I found in different archives in Spain, different European countries about these issues. And now I'm, I want to say that I'm also going to Latin America to also interview more actors from the other side to complement this point of view. What I found is, of course, and that was the case with European integration, there was an accent put on the idea of commercial trade relations and uh, regional integration through these uh, trade points of reference. No? But at the end, and in a, uh, I don't know, a recurrent way, you always find this idea of leading towards a political, creating a political point of reference. So there was always this idea. I think the political ingredient is always present. And I think this is an interesting problem with European integration. Of course, gender is something that we will see if it really happens. But it was always there as an idea.
for finishing with this question, I, was, I wanted to ask uh, answer also the question of the overlap of interests. Maybe it's personally said badly, but I didn't talk about an overlap of Spanish and European interests. I talk about an overlap, a coincidence of discourses, not interests. So uh, I think that was very pragmatic on the on the side of Spain because Spain wanted to have a monopoly of relations with Latin America as the UK wants to have a monopoly if possible relations with the US. So they said, you know, we have the language, the culture, these links, so we want to lead this. You have to, to rely on us to manage this aspect of uh, EU foreign policy. And the Spanish, the Spanish representatives, the Spanish government realized you would have to wait if it went in a different direction than that of uh, the EU foreign policy or the EC guidelines in the past. And the very, very important question of urbanization, of course we have to, to talk about the, the sediments, the colonial sediments. It's not that Europe has never been there before, I mean, you have the languages, Portuguese in Brazil, Spanish all over Latin America, you have some kind of political culture, but it's, it's still very, very different. You have a you know, common culture, and in many documents they even talk about something they call the shared civilization, that are very epic terms. So the colonial sediments are important for this further Europeanization, but it's more related to, to the process of European integration transplanted in other continents. But um, I would like to, to read you something that I, uh, is coming, is becoming more and more Formally, I don't know if we're really implementing them, but there are, for example, the questions of solidarity as a principle, equality, open competition, sustainability, and participative democracy. This is becoming more and more apparent in the Latin American agenda and priority setting, and I think this is a, a, a manifestation of this organization. And then I would also like to mention the adoption of a language. I think is a very interesting example of internalization of this organization process and I could give you some very clear examples for example the sustained political dialogue since 1999 since the real process doable economic cooperation and development of trade public aid in pursuance of development enduring support for regional integration process and finally defining compact with promotion of human rights and democratization so there's also this side of adoption of language and this adoption of the common language is the key for the development of the relation. And just finally, I would like to say that the main objective now for Latin America is to move on from a development aid, as I also said yesterday, to cooperation on more equal terms. So this is real expectation. And as I said in my paper, I don't know this is this image is being reflected in the mirror of relations with you, but hopefully. Exhaust was too 
was dirty or was it too much noisy or was the um, uh, windows or the star line was too small or too big, etc. I mean, they had no rule makers and they would change the rules every month, so to say. And this was precisely what the commission was complaining, that the Japanese are fooling the Europeans or the Americans, that they're changing the rules every day and that is used as a barrier. So it became that the Japanese ministry has to admit that that sort of safety test, called it Japan, has to be done in Europe by Europeans and Japanese jointly. And that's a good point. I mean, you know, Japanese still, I mean, the psychology of both the Japanese companies and the ministry is still that of the developing country. Why? No, who made the good thing? Why couldn't we ask for blah, 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 blah? You know, but what Japan was doing as a closed market was so much unfair, especially for France and Italy, because you also want to export the cheese and the wine and the prosciutto and but yeah, why not? And, uh, but it's so closed market, so it's no good business for Italy or France if Japan keeps on closing its market like that. And it was temporarily sold by the Japan Japanese Airlines buying uh, Airbus airplanes, or even buying uh, very expensive pictures temporary sort of uh, ruining the uh, statistics that the trade balance is not so big, but of course that doesn't work. I mean, you buy Airbus plane, but you're not buying every year. So uh, there's a trick there. Uh, that's still a problem in Japan. But I think the Japanese consumers are a lot more cycling Europeans in that sense, because they want to buy European things rather than uh, dominated by Japanese products. So, and I think that's uh, the whole thing. So uh, this thing is about the uh, opening Japanese market. Uh, so uh, coming back to the um, Japanese business always rule, oh, kid on it, rule. Oh. Um, yeah, I think two ways, two channels that they have. Uh, one thing, and this is the most formal one, is that it's it's the kid on it who unifies the voices of Japanese companies and takes it to the Japanese uh, economic industry. Okay? And this was happening in, during the uh, trade conflict. Because if Japanese cars are controlled, the numbers are controlled, the export, that violates the German anti cocktail law that doesn't export cocktail. So it had to be done in a very sophisticated manner so that it's not violating American or German anti cocktail uh, export cocktail laws, but still controlling before exporting from Japan. And how that was managed was a careful consensus. Uh, ongoing negotiation between ET and the k representing all the Japanese producers, and carefully mined. Okay. So it's ironical that that was the same mechanism who built up the non-tariff barrier. But because of this problem, and because of the American and EC pressure, the, the same channel was used in order to help find a solution to this problem. Another channel, and this was more troublesome, but a lot more interesting for historians is their political pressure on Japanese political parties. And uh, the Keidan Ren, or the Nihon Keidan Ren is called today, um, it was suddenly forbidden that they couldn't give money to political parties. Because this money was so influential that any politician who grabbed that money would go to the foreign ministry or the Ministry of Economy and start talking for the Japanese friends in the name of Keidan Ren. Not in the name of Keidan Ren, of course, representing their interests and putting pressure, but of course that's a serious source of corruption that politicians want that money, it's huge money. So, and you find that in Korea, that if any presidency retires and they soon find some corruption cases, and something a bit similar to that happens. And, but then uh, we now have different two parties uh, who could take the administration. So the k Ren once more now could give money want to see how this is going to show up. Uh, so that those were the uh, answers. Uh, now about the uh, council, uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, how was the um, Japanese public opinion responding to uh, Japanese parents building cars or whatever in Europe? I think the Japanese public opinion was not even aware of what was going on. That the minister of Shiba was saying, global nature, but no one had a glimpse of what is a global nature, or that how much serious 
business flooding out from Japan was never even sort of reported to the Japanese public. And anyways, I mean, there was a Japanese economic boom during the 80s, so who cares? I mean, there was too much money, 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 money. So no one cared, even if factories were transformed into uh, Filipino, was in Indonesia and, and France and, and uh, Belgium, but uh, the public didn't say it's a big thing here. I mean, it, it, it was too much good economy. So suddenly it became a problem when the boom died down uh, after the Masters in the 90s and even today, that Japan started thinking, well, look, we, I think we sort of flooded too much jobs outside while uh, we find too less right now back home, and uh, there's nothing to uh, supplement that instead. So, the Japanese public really, uh, didn't know simply, I would just put it like that, but probably that needs a bit more research. About the council, I'm not sure, and this is the precise reason why I'm interested in uh, Helen Wallace's sort of uh, studies about the council ministers, because um, I'm not really sure, I have to look into the many other cases, because how does this work, the commission and the chair of the council, how do they actually cooperate, might differ due to the chairmanship because it will be chaired by a German foreign minister or a German foreign minister. It could be changing during the different chairs. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, this, this case always works or not. It might depend on different uh, chairing countries. So uh, sorry, but I think we have to look into this in, in different cases and uh, in different time periods. So uh, uh, just a suspended answer. Now, to the question of um, the America and the context, um, well, how much Japan saw the EC market as attractive or not? And uh, I think this is a case which Japanese companies or industry was slightly different from the American case. That um, at least what the Kedan and the sources, the Japanese business lobby sources, secondary sources there are, uh, at least what these tell is that Japan didn't see Europe as a big business chance. So it was not so much expecting a huge success. Rather more, it seems that their business executive, be it the Nissan or Toyota or Panasonic or Sony, whatever, that they saw the success in Europe as very important for their competitiveness or renewing their competitiveness. That if they are successful in the European market, that means they are very highly competitive in the Japanese market. And that shows well in Japan. Look, this, this electric blah 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 sold well in Italy, so this is the top fashionable and that sells good in Japan. So probably it was not the question of how much money Japanese firms could make in Europe, but it was more about the prestigious or the sharpening of more the competitiveness of Japanese firms. So I think the Japanese industry had slightly different interests than the Americans investing in Europe. And I'm not sure if that's a good case for the Europeans or not, but I think there is a slight difference between what Americans want and what the Japanese want by coming into Europe or spending, investing money uh, in Europe. I think this should be investigated because I'm still, this is very still secondary sources I'm speaking about. And, uh, some details might be different. Uh, now, um, so, uh, what was the last point? Um, so yes, the uh, Japanese firm also expanding business to the Asian countries and what, 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 what relation does this have with the European case? Uh, this, this is, well, this part has to do with the, what's the data and all has to do, but also, I'm not really sure because I haven't looked into this issue. It's true that Toyota or Honda or any company has a worldwide network of producing, because factories are not only in Japan, they are mainly in Thai, Bangkok, or was it in Indonesia, or in China these days. Um, so was Europe was, what, a test case? For Japan seriously having its bigger, biggest network among the Asian countries, or was Europe a more symbolic case? Just as I said, it's, it's a competitiveness. It's sharpening and strengthening Japanese companies' competitiveness of making attractive goods. Uh, whether was it symbolic like this, or was it meant as a really serious test case to be more successful in Asian countries? I'm not really uh, sure which they meant. And probably it's possible to assume at least that K 
Kedar and, and the Nikolong ministry could have had slight differences in this thing. Because if I'm asked uh, in this EC Japan trade conflict, who was the most nationalistic or who was the most protectionist among the Japanese government and business, it first seems that it's the Japanese government who's the most aggressive, but uh, at least evidence shows that it's, it's Miki who's most protectionist even more than the Japanese companies. Because the Kenade was saying that, look, the Europeans could keep their safeguards if they could abolish that in the future, but Miki was far more hard-line than this, and kept on saying that Europeans are unfair, 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 and coming up with so much statistics that it's boring, because they keep on saying the same claim with so much different statistics. So the most hard-line was Miki, and this comes to the American scholar of uh, the notorious Miki and all the critics of Japan Corporation, Japan CEO, etc. And that's the right to be, because if you look at the Miti, yes, they are um, quite nationalistic. But the Minister of Foreign Affairs is a lot more understanding of the Commission's position. And Japan's very vulnerable position, the Japanese cars might sell well, but this is a serious diplomatic problem. And if the diplomatic problem doesn't solve, it will directly come to boycotting, not buying Japanese products, which would soon become also a business problem. Minister of Foreign Affairs was aware enough that they really had to come up with some agreement with the Commission if they want to avoid any serious future problems. So that's why I wanted to uh, speak about this.
relation uh, to, the, to the Turkish government in order to um, freeze or to suspend the uh, freedom of workers, the organization of the freedom of workers during the association relationship, throughout the association relationship. Well, of course, the Turkish government rejected that. Uh,
more gender, political, political, and also cultural aspects regarding the, 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 the regarding Turkey. And then Turkey, of course, will take take its position in accordance with the EU decision. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Yeah, okay, we can move and start around here later.